the second talk of Indigenous Ed. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, I'm going to talk about how to be wrong. Yes, most of will talk about how to be wrong. I'm going to talk a little bit about stuff that I learned from each thing as well. I want to start by saying something that's not on the talk, but which I sort of realised after listening to the first talk of the day, which is great. Uh, which is that it's okay to be wrong. Like, you're going to make heaps of mistakes. These are some terrible mistakes that I've made, one of them particularly terrible. <laughs> but it's fine, it's fine being wrong. But I figure I should start by introducing myself. Apparently, that's the done thing. So, I'm Jeremy Burgess, I'm technical director at Pickpock, uh, which means I run the code department there. I've uh, been in the industry for almost 12 years. I started straight out of uni in 2006, and I went to what was then She, worked there for four and a half years. Then I went to Codemasters in the UK, which I thought was essential to see the world and experience Europe. I spent three and a half years there. Then my wife and I had a kid. We decided we wanted to be back at home. So we came back. I tried to rejoin She, but found that change for the man. So, <laughs> Uh, I've worked on lots and lots of projects. I've worked on like four or five at She, and another four at Cody's, and then me and more since so returning to TikTok. And I've been wrong a lot. So I made lots and lots of mistakes. Um, the things I'm going to talk about today are a very small subset of those. I've seen lots of mistakes. I'm not going to talk about any of the mistakes I've seen. Originally I did, but I've reduced this down to only my mistakes. So. Uh, but before I go any further, I want to drop some wisdom. <laughs> cool. So, as programmers, we're often given guidance on how to be right, like what the right thing to do is, the right particular piece of software engineering that we should apply. And it comes in many forms. At the start of our careers, we're told to keep it simple, we're told to make sure that our designs are not over engineered, that we're building the right solution for the right problem. And this is very good advice, like it's something which every programmer should keep in mind. Uh, then later, we're told to do some upfront design because we're building something bigger and we want to make sure that you are actually thinking about it before you start. Don't want to do all your code design in code. Uh, has everyone here heard of Yankee? No. Yep. No? Okay, it means uh, you ain't going to need it. So <laughs> the, the principle is if you are looking at a spec sheet, and then you're designing a system to serve that spec sheet, and then you think, maybe I need this additional feature. No, you don't. You ain't gonna need it. Just build the thing that actually does the task you're trying to do. And then there's more advice. So in the modern, the modern webby world, we're told to move fast and break things, by which we mean we don't want to kind of like stay still. We should try something different, even if it does have a chance of breaking something. Uh, and yet at the same time, if something's already working, we shouldn't refactor for no reason. Uh, we should also not under-engineer because you don't want to build something that's too small for the problem you're trying to solve. And test early and test often is like the mantra of test driven development. But the advice goes on and on and on and on and on, <laughs> right? Like, we get tons and tons of advice. There's loads of websites online that tell you stuff. You can go to Wikipedia's page on like uh, coding doctrines and there are heaps of that. <laughs> um, and this fact is all really important. A lot of it is true, most of it is true. To some extent, I'm in front of some of it, just didn't realize. <laughs> um, but a lot of this stuff is actually quite narrow, and it's most useful, in my experience at least, as correctives. So these are things which are really, really helpful to tell someone when they're going down a particular path which could be helped by one of these particular pieces of advice. So some people are very prone to over-engineering, and so you want to tell them to think about that. Some people are very prone to under-engineering. The other end of the scale, you want them to go and do some upfront design and think about what they're doing before they start. So without further ado, I'm going to move on to my mistakes, which is, I guess, in relation to that, to talk about the fact that what we don't talk about enough, in my opinion, is where we get things wrong and the kinds of lessons we can learn from those mistakes. So I'm going to start off my biggest mistake. Um, this one's quite a big mistake, so don't think too much less of me. I guess most of you don't know me, so maybe it doesn't matter if you think too much less of me. <laughs> um, but uh, I'll move on to it now. So I'm going to take you. The way. Yes. Okay. I'm going to take you back in time to 2010. It was a glorious year. Uh, Donald Trump, Trump was not president. <laughs> uh, I just joined Codemasters as a senior program, so that was really daunting. Uh, uh, and 
we were starting a new project. It was a big project. I didn't know this at the time, but it was going to be something I'd worked on for two years. Um, our whole team would. It was also going to be the largest project I'd ever worked on. Uh, and we were making an online Formula One casual racing game that would be playable in the browser. So keep it in your mind. <laughs> it doesn't really matter, but that's fine. Uh, and because we wanted to do it in the browser, we really had two choices. We had Flash and Unity, and we decided to use Unity. But none of us had ever used Unity before. We only knew that we could make stuff that would run in the browser, so that was kind of exciting. Uh, Unity was also quite a lot more raw and nascent than it is now. I think the version we started with was 3.1. I don't know how many of you used it that far back. Uh, looks the same, doesn't work as well. <laughs> uh, that's fine. And as with all games, we needed a UI system. Um, so uh, I was tasked with looking into this. I had done a lot of UI at Sheep. I had done a lot of work on our internal native UI library, uh, which was something that I felt quite knowledgeable about. I felt reasonably well qualified, or as well qualified as anyone ever is, to do this kind of stuff. So first of all, looked into some stuff that we could have bought to do the job. Uh, at the time, the only thing that we found that sort of looked vaguely credible was EasyGUI. I don't know how many of you have used EasyGUI. Uh, we decided we didn't like it. Um, so we didn't use it. We decided to build our own. Uh, in GUI, which sort of became the, the standard a little bit later, as far as I know, it didn't exist at this point. We certainly didn't find it. Um, yeah. So, how did it go? As you can guess from the setup, not well, but <laughs> uh, there, there's more to it than that. So, um, I built what I knew, uh, but with immunity. That probably is a red flag to lots of people, um, but at the time it wasn't for me. Um, and I was like, well, it's a UI system, I should support building from XML, but it's also in Unity, so I should support building from nodes in the scene because you want, want to do both, right? Maybe. Uh, and so we could build the UI in Unity or in a hypothetical external tool which didn't exist. But we could build that tool. Um, I had just been exposed to CSS in a big way for the first time, and I loved it. So I was like, CSS is a business, styling stuff is so cool. <laughs> so I can support styling, because why wouldn't we support styling? Um, so that was great, I built my little like, thing that could look up entities by class name, and it all worked, and that was very exciting. And I wanted to give Mark enough control to do everything, so my heart was in the right place. Like, I, I knew what I wanted to do, I wanted us to be able to do stuff. But because I sort of misunderstood some of the things about Unity, it was hard to animate stuff. It didn't work with Unity's inbuilt animation stuff. Uh, it wasn't drag and drop. You had to enter numbers into the inspector to move things around. So it was somewhat flawed from the outset. What went wrong? Probably obvious already, but I'm going to go through it because I, I like to self flash a little bit. <laughs> so it was inflexible for R. Um, they couldn't animate stuff without programs. It's a huge problem, huge, huge, huge problem. We had had the same problem at Sheep, which we eventually rectified. Um, and my intent was that we were going to build a tool that would let you animate this stuff. Now, that, that was wrong, and I'll talk a bit more about what we should have done in a moment, but that was a problem. And as a result, that cost time, and that limited what we could do. And that, in turn, limited the visual quality of what we could create. So we couldn't make it rich UIs in the way that Art wanted to, and so that constrained everything, it slowed stuff down, it burned hours on both the code and the art side. A lot of time was wasted that didn't need to be. We never built the hypothetical external tool, and it might surprise you to know this, but we never used the style of the <laughs> um, And I was quite tunnel visioned a little bit about this stuff. And so I was resistant to making necessary changes to make it work with Unity stuff. It would have entailed rewriting a lot of the other structure of it. We would have had to build tools to translate the data formats and whatnot. It was a lot of work, and it just seemed like it was too much. It was too big of a hurdle to, to get over for us to make that change, turn that shift. So what was my mistake? Well, there were a lot of mistakes, but these are, I think, the, the big sort of things that I, I got wrong. We didn't really understand the artist workflow on Unity when we started. Now, in truth, we couldn't really have understood the artist workflow on Unity because we hadn't used it on a project. But maybe that was part of the mistake. Maybe we should have done it, just built something smaller than our two year epic project for the very first thing we were going to do in this engine we hadn't used before. Supporting the Unity animation and toolchain stuff, so actually doing stuff in the editor, should have been paramount. It should have been like the number one thing we cared about. 
the integrity of technical design, so all the stuff that did work, and like, you know, I mean, looking back, the code itself for the system was fine. Performance-wise, the UI worked. It did what it was supposed to do. It just didn't address the needs of the outside team well enough. And then we didn't change, we didn't understand the development platform well enough. And once we did, we didn't change course. So that was a, a big problem. And as an addendum, I was not the lead in this case. I should have been corrected. So if you are in the position of being a lead and you can see someone doing this and, and you're like, I want to stand up for my team, there are times when you shouldn't. There are times when you should look at what the consequences are for everyone else and not just stand by the program and say, this actually needs to change when you turn this time and turn the ship. So what have I learned? I learned a lot from this experience. It's still, as I say, a mistake that I look back on and think that was probably the most consequential mistake that I've made professionally um, in terms of what it actually cost us as a team. So first, understand the tools as much as possible before you make big decisions. And if you can't, then assume you're going to get it wrong. So when we started that project, what we should have done is said, okay, we don't like easy move, we're going to build a UI system. Let's assume that the first version of it is going to be in some way fundamentally broken and budget enough time to, to rebuild it, re-architect, to change it, to work better. Which I actually didn't say to but I was going to get there. <laughs> and then finally, and this is perhaps the most like fundamental mistake that I made, we should have respected systems which did understand the scenario, because in as much as we didn't like easy GUI, it would have been a better choice. Like, in hindsight, we should have paid the money, we should have looked at the stuff we didn't like, and changed it. That would have been a far, far, far better choice for the project. Um, and, and it's easy to look back and say that, but it's a really important lesson. If you're moving to something that you don't know, and there is stuff that you can buy that does the stuff that you want to do, even if it seems imperfect, you should probably assume that they understand the problem they're solving better than you do. So, yeah. And now we can move on to a less bad mistake, so you can all erase that from your memory. <laughs> Maybe not the limits, if you've got any. So, this is a smaller error, something that was more easily corrected. Uh, I'm just going to talk through it. Oops, that's the purpose of the So, um, I'll take you back slightly less far. We're now in 2014. Yes, 2014. I just did pick up and I had taken over the online services team which may seem like a slight step sideways in terms of like being the UI guy, but uh, that same project, that online racing game, uh, as I said, it's an online game, so I had been exposed to databases and servers. I had a good amount of experience at that point there. I was not an expert by any means, but I had enough experience. Maybe enough experience to be dangerous. Um, as it turned out. <laughs> and, um, and we were building a site event for Wild South Basketball, which I highly recommend. Uh, <laughs> You can download it now, yeah, cool. uh, <laughs> um, and it needed tournaments. We decided we were going to have online tournaments, and tournaments are kind of hollow without prices. There we go. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> so we needed to build something to do this. So we needed to build a modern leaderboard event service. Um, so we had leaderboards, but we had no way of scheduling them and having different prizes and making sure that if you were in position one, you got the epic super gold card, and if you were in position 10,000, you got, I don't know, 100 gold, whatever it was. Um, so I was like, well, I don't really know anything about asynchronous, pro uh, asynchronous like, processes on servers. Uh, so I don't know how to do like, request-based stuff, I don't know databases, but I don't know enough about this. So I'm just going to do the most obvious, simple thing. Uh, I'm going to just make a reward every one sequence, which seems, on the face of it, like it's like, well, you should try it and see if it's a problem. The question I should have asked is that one. Mm -hmm. uh, and the answer is very slow, uh, much slower than I thought, um, for a number of reasons. One, I didn't test with wholly representative numbers, and two, I tested on this laptop and not on the AWS nodes that we were actually using. <laughs> so when I say very slow, what I mean is like, because I guess slow can mean different things, it could take 30 to 40 minutes 
to reward an entirely new body. That's a long time. It's a very long time when you're running it on a node in the cloud that is part of an autoscale cluster where that node can actually be taken away from you. Uh, it's also problematic because if this is a data error, then the whole rewarding thing is going to fail. So the performance may have fragile up and then you get a really sort of thing. Now, I'm smart enough to know that if you're doing stuff with databases, you want to be transactional. So you wouldn't end up with bad data, but you could end up with very long delays. Particularly if one score had something go wrong with it, there was a, uh, an unrelated bug whereby if uh, customer support had deleted a user and their score was still leadable, the whole process would fail. We would then have to track down that score and remove it. That in and of itself wasn't that much of a problem, it said that it was because the process took 40 minutes and then we would have to find the user, delete their score, and rerun it to do anything. So you could end up with hours of delays before users got their rewards, which is not ideal. So the lessons I learned here were try to understand the scale of the problem for you, and in particular, try to test with realistic numbers on realistic hardware and then think about what could go wrong. Um, and in this case, the big like, thinking piece that I missed was I didn't have a long enough conversation with our infrastructure staff who could have told me that nodes could go away without me knowing about it. And therefore, that in a long running process, running the salary, which is that asynchronous task processor, would be a problem. Like, that they shouldn't really run for longer than about 30 seconds because you never know that a node could just go away. And in the worst case, don't be afraid to go back to the drawing board and fix it, which is what we did in this case. So this was not so bad because within the next couple of weeks we took the system apart, turned it into something which processed things in parallel blocks. So we broke the leaderboard up into 2,000 user groups, and then each 2,000 user group would become its own asynchronous task. Those would run in like 20 seconds, they were very fast, actually probably even less than that to be honest. Um, that would fan out across the entire fleet of our Hitler Plus nodes each of which could run multiple jobs at a time, and so something which took 40 minutes would then take two minutes. And not only that, if there was bad data, it would only break one 2,000 user block of the plus we can fix that bug. And then actually, just one more piece of advice, if you're ever doing this yourself, don't actually do it this way, this is the wrong way to do it. So, <laughs> so we now rebuilt the event service entirely so that it is request-based, which seems way more obvious in hindsight. Um, so when you get to the end of the tournament, we just send out a message, a generic message that says to the user, you put a prize, and then when they log in, they need to uh, query their reward. So there's no asynchronous processing at all, and it can scale to infinite users. Yeah. <laughs> scale as far as our rest cost and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, good. So not so bad. Uh, tools. I love tools. Uh, by being here, you are missing a panel of tools, so maybe you don't love tools quite as much as I do. But I'm missing that panel too. So, yeah. um, so I, I love tools a lot. Um, I've always loved tools as a way to enable people to do stuff. Um, and this is a story about when a tool would have been a really good thing to have, or a better tool would have been a, a better thing to have. So, take me back to that same project that had that UI stuff, because the UI thing alone wasn't really enough for me to do. Uh, we also needed to do a flow system, and that was then given to me as a task, and my lead and I discussed it, and we had some really neat ideas about this hierarchical state machine that was going to be the single, coherent, consistent way of driving a flow through the app. Wasn't going to drive the little game, the toy bit, the racing bit, but it was going to drive everything else. So when you hit a button, you were going to have a little node in the graph that was a button, Click that button, it's going to have another node, but it's logic. Matchmaking was going to be driven by this thing, everything was going to be driven by it. It's going to be awesome. I built it, and some really simple tools to work with it. Uh, and it worked. So, uh, this is an interesting one, perhaps, because I'm still super, super proud of what we built. It worked really well, but there were problems with working with it. So, the problem is that. <laughs> that big powerful systems need easy ways to interact with them. And this system was great, but the tools were very, very shallow. So it was just like a for the you know, Unity, it was a custom inspector, and the custom inspector would let you drag things around in it, and then you could click on a different node, which was a different asset, and you could drag things around in that. But you couldn't see anything. And half the point of this system was that we could actually model this whole game as a visual deep flow chart. But you couldn't see that flowchart. 
So what that ended up meaning was that to work with the system, you had to understand the system. You had to understand how it modeled those concepts. Um, and that was a problem. Now, it would have been possible to build something to do that, but it never seemed worth it. Like, throughout the whole project, we just never had the time. We never felt like we had the time. Um, and so we loved the code. We burned little bits of time throughout the project. Uh, because the tools were very basic, it was very easy to make a mistake with them. So human error became a significant component of, uh, of the problems that were generated. Uh, and art didn't understand exactly how it worked, design didn't understand exactly how it worked, so it became this like, very code-centric thing that only code is understood, even though when we actually tried to determine how a given screen would work, we were going to the whiteboard and drawing a flowchart and someone was translating that through the tool. It did exist. So it was okay, but it could have been way better. So later, after that project, everyone was like, well, the coders were like, this system was great, but it was terrible to work with. And one of them went away and, and built the tools we would like. And the tools were really, really good, was the long and short. Like, it made way more of a difference than I would have expected. Um, once we had tools, people could actually experiment with Flow more easily. We could show it to people, so I could bring over a product manager and say to them, look, this is how this screen works, and they can see how that screen worked. And the human error, in terms of editing the flow mode, went away. It just completely went away, because suddenly you could see what you were doing, you weren't just like dragging little assets around, you were creating visual links between different nodes. So the big lesson for me was, Tools didn't just make interaction possible, they actually enriched the project with possibilities. And that system, so that thing we built that I was super proud of, that actually migrated from that project to another project to another project to another project. It got reused over like five projects before the studio eventually got killed, <laughs> as sometimes happens in larger companies. Um, so the, that made it through, but I don't think it would have had we not built those tools, because working with it prior to the tools and system was painful. So it was really valuable as a, as a lesson for me in terms of just thinking about the amount of time that you should budget for that kind of work. Crucially, when you're building a system, you want to think about how it's going to be used and by whom. Who's going to use the system? Who do you want to be able to use the system? And what do you want to get out of it beyond just the basic requirements? And before I move on to the next set of stories, so we're halfway through, I hope everyone's still okay. <laughs> Good. Um, I guess I want to make a note that most of the areas I've talked about so far, most of my big mistakes, were about misunderstanding the problem in front of me. Not necessarily misunderstanding the fundamentals of it, but misunderstanding some crucial component. So in the first case, I didn't understand the development platform enough, and we didn't respect how different it was from what I had done before. In the second case, I didn't understand what the scale of the problem would do in the context in which it was running. And in the third case, I didn't understand what impact developing tools would have had on making everyone's life easier and how we should have budgeted that time, because even though it was a large block of time, it would have been far less than the time that it cost us to not have those tools over the course of the project. So category error or misunderstanding the problem that you're trying to solve is probably, in my opinion at least, the cause of some of the most fundamental mistakes that you can make. And again, it's fine to make mistakes, but try and understand the problem you're trying to solve before you solve it, because if you can, you're probably going to come much closer to a solution much more quickly. Now, I've given this talk before at our internal conference at Pickpock, and one piece of feedback I got, and I'd like to take on with feedback, is uh, I didn't talk at all about the small problems, that, the small mistakes that we as programmers make every day. So I rectified that. I'm going to talk about small problems now, just briefly. So big mistakes are kind of easier to talk about, to be honest. Like it's, it's easier to fill up on some sort of like problem like this and around something we're spending months on. But the easiest mistakes to repeat and the ones that drain most of our time day to day are little ones. They're things that we just get wrong because we were careless or because we were in a hurry or certainly in my case because I was in a hurry. But it's hard to tell good stories about small issues, so I'm going to tell two small stories about small issues. So, uh, our first is about to be fake. This is what programmers do all day, right? We just copy paste. 
So this is recent, very recent, like in the last couple months. I was implementing a new ad mediation layer into Interdeep. Again, another one in the bag. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, uh, and we 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 migrated basically we had migrated this year to a new ad mediation service, and so we had to migrate all our games. It was a huge chunk of work. Um, I've done one of them. It's good. <laughs> Uh, anyway, it's event-based, so I assume everyone here is familiar with event-based programming, like we have things that generate events, yep, cool, yeah. I'm not going to explain that here. Good. Uh, it's like, I've hooked up some events and everything seems to be working. I gave it all to QA, but it wasn't to be. I had a crash, I said, oh, no, what have I done wrong? I didn't think I changed anything around that, maybe I had changed something around that. I managed to reproduce the crash. I don't want to show you code that's responsible for the crash. Can anyone here see what's wrong with this code? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, this isn't where it goes. Uh, it's this. Yeah. And obviously, this line is the same as this line. Yeah. So, silly, silly mistake, right? And it doesn't obviously cause the crash immediately, but later it does because then this thing is destroyed and blah, blah, blah. It's an awesome number of things. Um, second story. Check your observations. So later, because again, I spent a lot of my life looking up air mediation layers, I was uh, looking up the same air mediation layer in one of our older native titles, and uh, one video from one, one provider was showing videos and black screens on Android. It's out, but no video. Couldn't understand what was wrong. I followed all the instructions. I had compared all the stuff I'd done to all the tutorials. I even went back to the source information for the original provider, so outside of the mediation layer, and what's different there, but not all still correct. So I couldn't figure it out. And I sent it to the mediator, I sent our APK to the mediator, and they were like, I uh, had a look and with an ADB, I found this one line in the log which you might have missed. I think this is the cause. You need to add this flag to, or maybe you should add this flag to the manifest. It's not in the tutorials, but do it anyway. I was like, okay. It didn't help. Uh, still not working. But then later, because I was working on another game doing the same thing at the same time, I was testing it in another game and it worked. I was like, that's weird. I haven't done anything different. It's exactly the same. No, I can it in the wrong file. <laughs> <laughs> so that was really delightful. And also for the guy in the mediation service who I had like gone back to and got it didn't work. I tried it, it didn't work. Oh, it's terrible. So that was really good. That was the gorgeous. <laughs> but um, in truth, though, I think the best we can do, the best we can sort of hope to do, is to obey your own rules. So I give people advice all the time. It's part of my job to tell people to do stuff. Um, sometimes I tell them to do good stuff. Sometimes I don't. Um, the crucial pieces of advice in this case are: check that you're doing what you think you're doing. Uh, Check your assumptions. Like, if, and this is actually a really good piece of advice, actually, for development in general. It's one that I get lots and lots of people. And people are like, I've tried everything, it doesn't work. It's like, well, what are you assuming is true? What's your starting point? Because sometimes the thing that you're assuming is true is not true. Like, in this case, that the file that you edited is the one that actually mattered. And always, always, <laughs> yeah. just be really careful. Like, if you're copy pasting something and then changing it, make sure you actually did change it and you saved it, yada, 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 all that stuff. So, yeah. So, who here has experience feature group? Yeah? Yeah, that's good, right? <laughs> so, um, I'm taking you back again to the United Kingdom, I'm the Queen, uh, and I was co lead on a project for the very short bit. We had committed to delivering something in about three months. We'd taken that online Formula One capable web based game, so we turned it into a challenge based mobile game, and we could do it in three months. So we're like, we can do this, all the code works, it's going to be easy to print out multiplayer, it's straightforward. Myself and the art lead, we got together and like, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do this, this. We're going to ditch the terrible UI system and use Ingui. Good decision. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and everything was going to plan. So we 
when you're trying to build something in three months with an expansive code base, adding an additional feature is not trivial. And so it might be surprising for you, because programmers are always really keen on large features getting added right at the end of the program. <laughs> <laughs> I was against it. <laughs> so I, like, I used all my personal cash out, like, we can't do this because it's risky. We don't have enough time, and I don't have enough people. How, how are we going to do this? It may also surprise you. <laughs> <laughs> Senior management heard my, heard my cries of sadness. And they gave me a program. <laughs> they gave us more time. And they acknowledged that it had not gone to this. So my technical assumptions were actually all right on this. But, that was a big but. It ended up being one of the things that I was like most proud of in that product. Like, by and large, I was super proud of what we were done. Um, from a practical perspective, it gave us another thing to sell and another way to try and play through the game. Because suddenly you had something where you could say, like, oh, we just do this extra thing and you do this extra thing. It was a paid game, so maybe that didn't matter so much, but it was still another, another cool thing that we had that was like, that's a nice thing. So, this experience taught me more than anything else in my whole career that sometimes the cost of something is worth the risk. Prior to this point, um, and still, to be honest, I'm a pretty risk averse person. I don't like adding risk to projects. But sometimes now, I'm like, well, back always now, when someone comes to me and says, can we add this thing? Can we do it? Can we squeeze it? And I'm like, well, let's talk about it. Let's talk about what the consequences will be. Let's talk about the benefits. Let's not just discount that it can. I have to stop myself. And now I'm like, my gut says, no. But now I'm like, Let's talk about it. Uh, the digital group was hard. The digital group was super, super proud of the result. But I was technically right that my conclusion was wrong. Uh, in the end, the game mattered more than the timetable, and that was what senior management, who were the ones who controlled the purse strings, would tell them. And I tried to listen to them on that. In fact, I was so proud of this thing that the one video I'm going to show you in this talk is a video of this feature. So this game unfortunately no longer exists, you can't get it. Uh, Codemasters have pulled it down from both the Play Store and the App Store, so this is the only exposure you'll ever get to it. Um, and this, hopefully... No. This <laughs> 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 was like my one fear that this bit was not going to work. <laughs> Uh, did the same thing last time. <laughs> <laughs> now, is it going to work now? Yay! Thank you. So, as you can see, I'm exploring my Red Bull car, and now I'm unlocking exciting content. This is all about the front wing, and the rear wing, a very important component of Formula One cars. Um, I will say I knew nothing about Formula One before I started at Cody, and now I know quite a lot. Uh, <laughs> you can go and browse for the exciting information about your favorite Formula One driver, Sebastian Vettel. <laughs> uh, all learned about the circuit of Catalonia in Spain, which has got lots of exciting trivia. So this thing took us like quite a lot of work, but it was just super, super cool to be able to navigate around, see all these bits of the car, like the car to start, right? And that showcased it, it showcased all the stuff that people who were fans of this kind of content were going to love. And they do, right? Like Formula One fans love trivia. Sports fans in general love trivia. I put this down since I don't want to see what to do with um, Cool. So uh, finally today, I'm going to talk about wishful thinking because this is uh, something that I think. I have certainly been guilty of many, many times. People around me have been guilty of many, many times. I've seen examples of this. I have done it a lot. Um, we all like to think wishfully about lots of stuff. This is not tech specific. Here are some examples of wishful thinking that I have seen and been guilty of. <laughs> The answer is, of course, yes. Yes, it will. If it just happened to me, it's going to happen to lots of other people. More maybe according to free play people, but yes, they can be. And relatedly, yes, it is very possible that real users will not spend more. Uh, and finally, for, for programmers in general, only <laughs> <laughs> one time out of ten, that's true. <laughs> so, 
Most of the time, we collectively get it wrong. Uh, data lies less often than you would think, uh, although there is a caveat that sometimes it can be more specific than it appears. So particularly for things like revenue, if you are doing free to play mobile, then check your territories, because if you've released only into Brazil, you're not going to get the same sort of spend figures you will out of the US. Um, and just in general, be skeptical whenever you can't believe the thing that's right in front of you, because it's probably true. So, closing out, I'll come back to this slide. All of these exciting things are true, to some extent, and in some contexts. But they often won't help you make big decisions. They often won't help you in terms of seeing when you're going down the wrong path. Um, and they're often quite narrow. So how can we be more or less? Um, it doesn't matter, maybe. <laughs> Programming rules are true, usually, in some contexts. But they should be thought of as helpful guidelines. At least to me, that's how I think of them. They're, they're like, if you're doing test driven development, yes, you should test early and test often. You should think about the benefits of test driven development for you. Does it apply to the project? If not, why not? Um, but they're not, like, they're, they're not one size fits all rules. Try to look at mistakes, because you will make mistakes. Only your mistakes. Your mistakes are something that can be uh, foundational for you. I continue to make mistakes every day. Um, I continue to try my best to say, yes, I got it wrong. It wasn't just, you know, the amorphous team. It's very easy, like in a postmortem, to sit down and say, these things were gotten wrong. It's much harder to say, I got this thing wrong, and this is what I can learn from it. If there's one big lesson, Try to understand the problem you're trying to solve before you solve it, at best you can. Because the better you understand the problem, the better your solution will be. There is no silver bullet. I will say thanks to Inspirebot, because I love Inspirebot. <laughs> <laughs> and I think if anyone would like to ask any questions, I've got time for them, but if not, then I'm done. <laughs>
it's a worth it. So you're probably right that ideally we wouldn't have had a system where, say, the, the context for rewarding a particular kind of rewarded video was created and destroyed and would just persisted all the time because it would make more sense. But in practice, like that was actually a UI screen that was transient and needed to know when the reward had been issued because it needed to update stuff and it needed to be event based because the system it was connecting to was event based. So I wasn't going to rewrite iron source, so I just couldn't do that. It's not within my power. So you're right that sometimes it's better to make the broader decision to actually build something which is more robust, but sometimes you don't have latitude to do that. Yeah. Yes. Um, you spoke about the reality that we make mistakes all the time. Do you have any tips about fostering an environment where it's safe to make yes. mistakes? So we talked about this, uh, I went to a really, really good workshop um, yesterday <laughs> when we talked about this extensively. Um, so at Cody's, we actually had a very healthy attitude of it being fine type mistakes. We had this thing called the orange of disapproval, which was the shriveled husk of an orange with an angry face drawn on it. And when someone made a bad mistake, like they broke the build, or it could be something else, but broke the build was the most common one, um, the orange would end up sitting on their desk until an empty person made a mistake. Um, and it was small, it was lighthearted, and it was funny, and we had a good enough uh, team dynamic that no one felt like that they were being shamed by it, which I think is a risk. Like, I do think there is a risk in terms of having that, and some people are just uncomfortable with that kind of public thing, even if it is supposed to be funny. So, I think it can be done. I think it's highly dependent on the, the team that you have, and whether everyone is kind of on board with that. Um, I just try to tell people all the time that it's fine. That, and, and I think the other thing is that in all of these cases, even the bad UI system, that wasn't the reason that project ultimately didn't work. The reason that project ultimately didn't work is that it didn't make money. Um, and Cody just weren't willing to stick with it and change it for them to, to try and change that. Maybe it wasn't doable, maybe there was no route forward for it. So, like, I think that's one of the most important things to realize is that most mistakes that you can make however bad, are not that consequential for the, for the life and death of the project. But we all want to be wrong less, right? We want to be less, so, yeah. Oh. yeah. Sorry, I, I love this because I'm a student and I, every time I find new technology, I'm like, oh, wow, super really excited and stuff. Because I've been doing like, my a thousand calls, my single time is bad, we should use, so say, defense injection, yep. so we're using our slides properly, so I feel like, okay, I want to try it. It's like a bad system, it looks like yeah. a bad like, I think there's maybe a tool system where you don't have to include other classes and mm -hmm. other systems, but I loved it, but then I saw some of those the reports, I found that it was way too complicated, or maybe like, it should have just kept it simple, you know, like, it's not kind of like a rule of, it's something like, skip it simple, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think it could be your advice to, you know, implementing a new, um, or like a new program practice to something you are already working on, should you like do it on separate projects and if it works and it's not likely? I think it's like a hard, a hard question to answer to be honest, because every context is different and a learning context is very different to a professional studio context. And actually like an independence injection versus singleton is a really, a really good example. Singletons are kind of gross, and everyone accepts that they're kind of gross. <laughs> but sometimes they are the easiest and best way to get to where you want to be. Dependency injection is cool, but it's also way more complicated, and people need to understand how, like, what's happening to make use of it in a nice way. So I don't know. I don't, I, again, like I, I, part of the message of my talk is there is no one size fits all answer. Like you kind of have to look at the thing that you are doing and make that call for yourself. And sometimes the call is that you want to learn something new, and that's reason enough. Like, that's reason enough to do the new thing. But you just have to appreciate that when you do do something new, you're going to try and stuff you don't anticipate, and you're going to make mistakes that you don't anticipate as well. Uh, yes, indeed. Yeah, um, would it be possible to get these slides? Uh, sure, I will find a way to do that. I'm going to chat to someone from the conference um, and I'll come get a PDF version. This is in Keynote because I like Keynote way more than any other yeah. thing. So, and, and no one else can read Keynote stuff, so I'll pop here. <laughs> yeah, nice. Yep. Um, so what about longer term mistakes? And obviously you eventually realize, oh shit, this was a mistake. Do you have any advice for sort of putting out fires, I guess, or 
Yeah, it depends. Um, so, like for the the smaller the mistake, the easier it is to treat just effects. When it gets to a certain size, so again, so I'll come back to the device this morning. Just to say we didn't fix, we just the project died and that was that. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we so we actually did have a plan. Like as we came in towards sort of like we didn't realise it was going to die yet, but presumably some of it. But anyway, we oh yeah okay so I, I'm at time so I'll be real quick. Um, so. We didn't realize it was going to die, but it was. We had made the plan. We were going to switch to Ingui, and we were going to do that by progressively dropping bits of the UI out of the old system and replace them. So we were going to do it with layers. So the art team was going to rebuild all the pop ups in Ingui, and then the pop ups were going to all the Ingui based, and the background was not. And then we were going to rebuild the next layer down until we could do it. So we basically sat down as a group, and we were like, this is a problem. It's causing us ongoing problems, and we're going to keep doing this project. This is going to continue to be a huge problem. We have to fix it. How can we do it? And that's what we did come to a solution. But I think that once the project gets to a certain size, you've got to bring in everyone else who's involved and you've just got to sit down and figure out what the way forward is and how much it's going to cost you. Cool. Thank you very much.